name's Chris. Um, welcome to this Splice lecture on acute medicine. Um, and just as another quick introduction, um, we're very fortunate to have the help of uh, Dr. James Piper, who's, uh, who's a bit of an expert in all things acute medicine. Um, and he's very kindly given up his time today to help out. So if there are any questions, just let us know and we can we can direct them and clear some things up with with him. Um, so, yeah, so just just thank you to him for joining us. Um, OK. And then, yeah, so the, the VBOX poll um, is in the chat. If you sign into that and then we can can get some responses on the SBAs. Um, cool. So. So to start off with, these are the learning objectives that UCL Med School have put on their curriculum map. Um, and this is what they wanted you to get out of, of your acute placement. Um, and basically, I want to focus on kind of these two areas. So histories and differentials will, will come over time um, in terms of interpreting tests. Uh, I've added a, a link at the end to the UCL Acute Medicine YouTube channel, and there's a useful ABG interpretation website which can explain in in far more detail um ecgs there'll be some in the cardio lecture x-rays covered a bit in resp and ortho lectures um so what i'd like to get across in this lecture is the importance of having a clear and a focused structure and a, a way to approach acute medical conditions firstly for for when it comes to your oski um but then perhaps more crucially in real life when you're all doctors so that's going to be the the main part of the tutorial and sort of how to apply that structure to, to common medical emergencies. Um, so what, what is what is acute medicine? Why is it important? Um, because you, you learn a lot of specialties in quite a short period of time at med school um, and you learn about lots of conditions with management plans developed predominantly by registrars or consultants. Um, but there are some conditions that you need to act quickly. Um, you might have time to wait for the regular consultant. Uh, so, so that's why acute medicine is so important to know at this level. Uh, you realistically could be expected to manage some of these conditions or at least stabilise a patient until senior help arises. So um, a lot of this will relate to, to your OSCE as there, there will be an acute medical station in the OSCE. Um, but there are also some important key medical knowledge that, that might well be tested in SBAs. Um, so I've been trying to include that. Um, and yeah, so ideally we'd do this in, in a lecture theatre, um, could ask some questions, but um, I never really liked being picked on in, in online lectures and stuff. So I think the best way to, to go about this is to get a bit of paper or your iPads, not really for notes, but to try and sort of jot down your diagnosis or what your management is as we kind of go through these cases um, and you can, can test your knowledge uh, there. So we'll start with we'll start with an SBA um, just to get everybody warmed up with. Uh, so Isaac, if you could set the poll off, please. Thank you. Okay, cool. Excellent. So kind of the, the point I wanted to, to make with this first SBA um, is that if your patient's unresponsive, you start basic life support. So you've confirmed that there's there's no airway issues uh, and there are there are no signs of life. Um, you've called for help, which is good. Um, and so then, yeah, good quality CPR, chest compressions are the, the most important management in this instance. Um, so that was excellent. Um, so structure, and I'm going to keep banging on about this a bit because I think it's so important when you're, you're starting out. Um, I'm sure you've been in situations already where you get put under pressure and um, your mind kind of just goes blank in terms of what to do, what to say. Um, and when you turn up to an emergency for the first time or you get into that OSCE station, uh, it's likely to be the same. All of that harder knowledge just goes out the window in a bit of a panic. So having a structure to fall back on uh, will make it easy for yourself just to, to relax, keep calm and manage the situation effectively. Um, so 
this is the this is the structure that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, it often gets kind of hammered home. You get those those consultants or doctors who ask what's what's the first step in the management plan, and then the answer they're always looking for is is Doctor ABCDE. Um, but yeah, so it's very it, it's very good to remember this. Um, and uh, like I said, this uh, this will come up in an OSCE. Um, but if you stick to this structure, you'll ace the station. Um, then these stations, uh, there'll they'll be a bit of a brief about a patient and what's happened. Then they'll introduce you to a nurse who's been with the patient. Um, so yeah, so when, when you go into the station, it's, it's just a good idea to introduce yourself to the nurse, ask a bit more about what's been going on, whether they'd be able to, to help you assess this patient, uh, and then often useful to find out whether they, they've done any observations already. Um, and this should give you some clues as to, to what's going on early. Um, and then you start your assessment. So um, the first part of this is assessing for any danger. So a simple phrase like, I'm checking if it's safe to approach. Um, it's quite good just to highlight to the examiner that that's exactly what you're doing. Um, and really what you're doing is making sure the area is safe for yourself. Um, you're not going to be saving anyone's life if you've slipped and knocked yourself out or electrocuted yourself. Um, a little bit trivial, but it's important to remember. And then you try to elicit whether the patient is responsive. Um, so I quite like to, to start by introducing myself to the patient. So I'd come in and go, hello, I'm Chris. I'm one of the doctors. Can you hear me? Um, so then if, if nothing happens, you try again. Um, and still no response. You can give the patient a, a bit of a shake um, because it could be possible they're asleep and you don't want to be starting chest compression on someone who's having a nap um, and then you can introduce a, a painful stimulus like a trap squeeze or a sternal rub and if they are unresponsive still at this point this is when you might be starting to think about your BLS. Um, now I added in S uh, for myself when I was doing this in fourth year because I just kept forgetting to, to call for help um, when actually this is this is probably the most important step um, and something I didn't really appreciate until final year this year where there are different types of help you can get as well um, so kind of the basic level is just generically calling for help um, but you can it can show like a really good understanding of how a medical team works if you can ask for the right person to come and help you uh, so just some different types of help you've got local help which would be the the doctors and the nurses around you um, and you call them if you, you needed more hands to do things so like managing an airway and CPR or, or calling somebody if, if you're busy uh, and, need, and need them to take some bloods for you or do something for you. Um, so then you've got your crash call, your cardiac arrest call, um, and this is something to be aware of. So in hospitals, you put out the, the 2222 call um, or it's 999 if you're outside of the hospital. Um, that will get you an ambulance um, and this will, this will get you the crash team and help you to manage a patient in cardiac arrest. Uh, but this is specifically saved for cardiac arrests. Then sort of a step down from this is, is a medical emergency call. Um, and this can be called to sort of different things in different hospitals. Um, but this is a team of, of acute doctors who can come and get give you senior help quickly. Um, the other thing you can do is you might just work up the hierarchy in your own team. So by calling your immediate senior, which might be an F2 or a reg or a consultant, um, somebody who's working your team. Uh, and then there are just some others to be aware of, such as calling an anaesthetist if there's a difficult airway or the, the major hemorrhage call um, in, in a heavily bleeding patient. Um, and as a general rule, it's it's better to get help and not need it than not get it and then fill out your depth, which will ultimately be worse for the patient. Um, so never be afraid to ask for help no matter what level you're at. Um, and then kind of the final point I wanted to make here is that you can call for help at any time. Um, so I put the S in after response, just like I say, because I always used to forget. Um, and that's always a, a crucial mark in the OSCE. Um, but you can ask for help at any time. If, if you start to find something you're more concerned about, then you can call for, for additional help there. So on to, on to A. Um, and I'm sure you all know A stands for airway. Um, and the reason airway is first is because without a clear airway, your patient could die very quickly. Um, so continuing on the theme of, of banking on about structure, uh, in A, B and C, a good way to think through your assessment is this look, feel, listen, measure, treat approach. Um, and this will mean that hopefully you don't miss anything and the patient get the help that they need. 
so things to things to look for when you're assessing someone's airway. Are there any signs that they're struggling to breathe? Is there an obvious obstruction or any edema that might be preventing them from getting air into their lungs? Then on to feel. Can you feel the patient's breath? Can you feel that they're breathing? Um, and have a listen. Are there any added or worrying sounds there, such as stridor that might indicate an obstruction um, or gurgling that might indicate fluids in the airway or stertor, which is a snoring sound and might indicate that the patient has an unsafe airway due to their tongue obstructing their throat. Um, there isn't really much to measure when assessing an airway, but it's a good thing. Um, you could think about whether the patient might have a, a cervical spine injury. Um, a certain treatments like a head tilt chin lift should be avoided. Um, and yeah, then, then on to, to treatment. Um, there are a var variety of treatments um, indicated. I'll go through in, in the next few slides. Um, just to go back, actually. Um, and then this point of reassessing is, is something to always have in the back of your mind uh, when you're going through this doctor ABC assessment. Each time you do something, assess whether it's changed the situation um, and has it cleared the letter to allow you to move on to the next. So, for instance, by adding an oropharyngeal airway, has this sufficiently cleared the airway to allow you to move on to breathing? And then lastly, it's good to, good to go through this structure in airway to do a quick assessment. But a good indication if the airway is all right is is, is your patient able to talk to you um, and if they are then it's likely the airway will, will be okay uh, so yes yeah, so this is just a table of some things that could cause problems with an airway um, and then a list of treatments or interventions on, on the right that you might want to consider using um, just one note on this slide uh, just one intervention to note on this slide is is the anesthetist they're the ultimate airway specialists so if you are concerned about a patient's airway, um, they're there to help. Uh, you should that's the help you should request if uh, if you need it when you sh when you're shouting for your help. Um, and then some examples of treatments you might consider in airway. So it's it's often best to start with simple and, and non-invasive measures. So a head tilt chin lift is a basic maneuver that opens up the airway nicely, uh, and something gets taught in in your BLS course. Um, and then moving. Moving on to, to the jaw thrust, which is a, a way of opening the airway by pulling the jaw forwards and opening up the mouth. Um, it's the manoeuvre that anaesthetists do when they're putting someone to sleep before surgery, before they intubate them. So they do this to maintain the airway. Um, and it's a good one to know as it could be quite useful in the murder situation where you get called and someone needs to maintain the airway. Um, if you can do this and you can ventilate with a, a bag valve mask, then it will be a huge asset to any emergency team. Um, but these two manoeuvres are, are temporary. However, there's, there's uh, two more slightly definitive airways, are the, the oropharyngeal or the Goodell, and then the nasopharyngeal um, uh, adjuncts. So th these are most useful if the, the airway problems in, in the pharynx, in the upper airway. So the, uh, the Goodell, is, uh, you measure that from your lateral incisor, which is the, the pointy tooth, um, and then to the angle of the, angle of the mandible. And you insert this upside down, um, and then you rotate it 180 degrees to sit uh, and prevent the tongue from falling back into the throat. Um, and this is most useful in, in drowsy or unconscious people. Um, but those who are a little bit more conscious and can't maintain their airway might not tolerate the Goodell, they might cough or spit it out. Um, and in these patients, the nasopharyngeal airway is, is useful. Um, it goes through the nostril and into the nasopharynx to, to again sit at the back of the throat and maintain the airway. Um, this is measured based on the size of the patient's nostril and is inserted directly downwards or perpendicular to the face rather than kind of up someone's nose. Um, I think to be aware of with the nasopharyngeal airway is that it's contraindicated in the base of the skull fracture. Um, and I've got some signs just on the next slide, which, uh, which you can look for if you suspect a base of the skull fracture. Um, two more instruments useful to know are the anchor sucker and the McGill's forceps. Suck can be used to remove fluid um, or vomit or blood from the patient's airway. And then the forceps can be used for any physical obstruction. Um, the things to note with these is that uh, when using them, you shouldn't just go fishing at the back of the mouth. Um, you'll always need to be able to see the tips of the instruments when using, uh, using them. And then finally, I've included intubation here because this is the definitive airway. Um, if the patient can't maintain their own airway and are deteriorating fast, you've exhausted all the other options, then, then they'll need to be intubated. Um, 
and these are just the the two sides of a base of the skull fracture I was talking about. So on the left you've got these panda or raccoon eyes, um, and then on the right you've got battle sign, which is bruising sort of on the mastoid behind the ear. Um, if you see those, you might suspect somebody has fractured the base of their skull. So moving on to breathing, so this is the first of kind of the big sections. Um, I've written this structure out again um, as kind of how I work through it. So again, we're starting off by just looking at the patient. Are there any signs of respiratory distress? Are they cyanos? Are they using accessory muscles? Um, then next is, is, is a bit like an accelerated respiratory exam. Going to feel the chest uh, for equal expansion, make sure that the trachea isn't deviated and then have a, a quick, quick tap on the chest, um, listening for any changes in sound. Um, and then listening to the chest front and back, are there any added sounds? Is there a wheeze or a crackle? Um, or are the, are the breath sounds normal? Or are the breath sounds even there? Um, then the key things we want to measure here are the O2 saturations and the respiratory rate, two key indicators of how unwell a patient is. Um, is the respiratory fast? Is it slow? If it was fast, it could be due to an obstruction or asthma, pulmonary embolism, anxiety. Um, if it's slow, it might mean that the patient's sedated or has raised intracranial pressure, or it could be quite a serious sign of exhaustion if somebody's having an asthma attack. Um, and then O2 sats, are they hypoxic? Hypoxia kills, so it's it's always a good thing to, to know about. Um, and then other options of, of things you might consider here uh, are ordering an ABG, which can tell us a lot of useful things in terms of respiratory failure, acidosis or alkalosis of the blood, lactate, etc. And then a chest X-ray um, is often useful to have, particularly if you're suspecting respiratory or, or chest pathology. Um, and then moving on to treatment, um, the most important treatment here to remember is oxygen. So starting a, a patient on high flow oxygen may be a life-saving intervention as, as we said, that hypoxia kills. So um, it's quite useful to know the different types of oxygen delivery and, and how to prescribe them. Another thing that often comes up in, in OSCEs is, is prescribing oxygen. Um, and then other treatments to consider here, nebulizers and steroids in conditions like acute asthma or exacerbation of COPD, which help to dilate the airways, allow your patient to breathe more easily. Uh, and then again, always reassess, has your intervention worked? Are the saturations going up? Is the rest rate going down? So just a, just a few things on oxygen here. So um, these are you, you, a few different types to consider um, and you kind of work your way up the ladder. So at the, the top left, you've got your nasal cannulae used for just to top up somebody's oxygen, low levels of oxygen. Then in the middle, simple face mask. Again, uh, lower levels of oxygen if they just need to top up some of these levels. The bottom left is your, your non rebreathe mask, and this is the one that you turn your high flow oxygen up in, in your acute scenarios. Um, and then these kind of colourful things on the right are your Venturi, um, Venturi mask. And this is really useful if you want to titrate to specific oxygen saturations. So, for instance, if you've got somebody uh, with COPD who is a CO2 retainer, um, then they, they can lose that um, hypoxic drive. And, and so if you give them loads of oxygen, then they'll slowly stop breathing. So this can be very useful to, to titrate somebody's SATs in COPD. Then on to circulation. So another big section, um, but we're going to follow the exact same structure. So here we're looking for any signs of circulatory compromise. So is the patient cyanosed? Do they look sweaty or distressed? Is there any visible edema or swelling suggestive of heart failure? And then have a feel of the peripheries. Are they warm? suggestive of vasodilation sepsis or are they cool and clammy uh, suggestive of cardiac concern um, and then you can feel the pulses here do a cap refill uh, as well as feeling the apex beat or any heaves and thrills then uh, a quick listen to the heart sounds completes the kind of brief cardio exam are there any new sounds or added heart sounds um, and then the key things to measure here are basically the rest of your normal observations so Get another heart rate, blood pressure, cap refill, take a temperature, and it's also good to monitor urine output. Um, some additional investigations to consider, cardiac monitoring, which is basically an ECG, um, some basic blood tests, considering cultures or any other specific blood tests. So for instance, ordering troponin level if uh, you're suspecting an MI. Um, and then it's time to, to treat your findings. So a lot of treatments you like to give are 
intravenous medications. Uh, so the first thing you need to do is insert cannula to be able to do and give these medications. Um, so this is just quite a good stock OSCE phrase. Um, so I'd, I'd insert two wide bore cannula into each antecubital fossa, um, and then you can give your, your medications through that. Um, and once you've done this, you can think about your more specific treatments. So if the blood pressure is low, uh, or the patient has signs of dehydration, then fluids are a good idea to think about. Uh, if there are signs of infection, then antibiotics could be given if the patient's in pain or feels sick, uh, then you can give some pain relief or an antiemetic. Um, and the aim is, is to try and stabilise the patient for when the specialists arrive to, to initiate the definitive treatment. Um, and you're reacting to what you find and treating appropriately. And then, of course, always remember to reassess once you've given your treatment. Uh, then on to disability. So this is a, an assessment of patient's conscious level. Um, but there are other aspects to check also. Um, so it's good to do a quick check of their neurology. Um, are their pupillary reflexes intact? Um, are they alert or what their GCS score is? Um, so having said that, GCS is, is more of a technical assessment, whereas this sort of alpha is a quick assessment. Are they alert? Do they respond to voice, to pain, or are they unresponsive? Um, and so then this kind of works out quite nicely because the P of ABBU, they're responding to pain, it's roughly equivalent to eight with GCS. Um, why is that important? Because while anyone with GCS of eight or less is going to struggle to maintain their own airway and thus will warn the airway support. Um, and then another very crucial thing to check is the glucose level. Um, so sometimes you might see, see the acronym ABCDEFG, so airway, breathing, circulation, don't ever forget glucose. Um, one just to keep in mind, so to remember glucose in this section. Uh, and then in terms of what you might measure, if you suspect a head injury, ordering a, a CT head might be appropriate. Um, in addition, it might be a good idea to, to check any medications or, or drug charts if they're available. Um, and then the treatment might be correcting glucose levels or, or getting the appropriate team referral for, for a low GCS. And then always reassess. And then lastly, E, exposure or kind of everything else. So expose the patient fully to check you haven't missed any rashes or bleeds or, or wounds that you should know about. Um, and then also now's the time to do any specific system examinations. So a good time to do an ab abdominal examination, for instance. And then you can kind of mop up any investigations you feel are, are particularly important. So sending off for cultures or, or swabs or putting a catheter in if, you, if you're not done already. Um, yeah, once you've got this structure down, the next step is to, to start thinking about what your differentials are and who do you need to talk to about this patient. Do they need a surgical review because they're going to have to go to theatre? Do they need cardiac intervention so the cardiology team need to be informed? If you can nail that, then the icing on the cake is can you start thinking about what that patient will need for that referral? So for instance, if they're going to be going to theatre, then they'll need to be placed nil by mouth, given some IV fluids and then some specific blood test orders, such as a group and save. And then, of course, reassess, keep reassessing. Has your intervention worked? Has anything changed? Um, and that is your that is your structure. If you take that structure into your OSCE station and you just go through those steps, then you'll all smash that. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to touch on this and we, we did a question on it. Um, this is BLS. You'll have done this multiple times, I think, throughout med school. Um, but I just put this in because it's kind of the, the foundation of acute medicine, and it, it's not uncommon for for BLS to a BLS question to be in the exam or to come up in an OSCE. Um, so it's quite useful to have some of these facts kind of close to hand. So knowing the specifics of how to perform good chest compressions is just useful knowledge in general. Um, so pressing two fingers on pressing two fingers from the sternal edge. Um, aiming for a compression of roughly a third of the chest wall depth and then at a rate of 120 compressions a minute. OK, so next SBA, please, Isaac.
Okay. Yeah, excellent stuff. Um, cool. So this question is your knowledge of, of advanced life support. Um, so the learning point I wanted to focus on here is whether or not you know your shockable rhythms. Um, so this patient is in cardiac arrest and has got no pulse. So the appropriate steps have been taken in terms of, of the team starting CPR, attaching the defib pads, and then the rhythm's been assessed. Um, and kind of what I've tried to allude to with the, the wandering flat line is, is that this is asystole. Um, there's no electrical activity in the heart and no pulse. Um, and asystole is one of the non-shockable rhythms and therefore CPR should be continued. Um, and then the addition here is that adrenaline can be given to try and get the heart going again, which is why D is the correct answer. Um, so advanced life support, this is your cardiac arrest situation. Um, so this is the um, recess council flowchart. Um, and if we kind of follow this through in our patient, um, they're unresponsive, CPR commenced and, and you've attached the pads. And then we're on the right hand side of this algorithm, um, your two non-shockable rhythms there uh, are asystole and pulseless electrical activity. Um, so again, asystole will look like a wandering line on an ECG, sort of a flat line, and then PA will, will basically look like a normal ECG, the issue being that the heart isn't pumping so that they're not going to have a pulse. And then on this side of the algorithm, you just continue CPR, um, minimising interruptions. Um, then on the left side, these are your shockable rhythms. So if ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia um, are seen, uh, so pulseless VT, you can initiate a shock to try and revert the heart back to the sinus rhythm before continuing with CPR for, for another two minutes before shocking again. And then this slide includes the, the second part of the answer. Um, so these are things to consider in, in ALS. Um, so giving a, IV adrenaline as soon as possible can help to resuscitate the patient. Um, the other medication to be aware of is amiodarone. So you can use that in shockable rhythms, um, again, to help with the resuscitation process. Then another useful thing to be aware of are the, the four H's and T's. These are your uh, these are your reversible causes of, of cardiac arrest. Um, and just perhaps something to think about more once you've qualified, but it's good to it's it's good to recognise. Um, so hypoxia, quite an obvious one. Without oxygen, your body can't function. Hypovolemia again, similar, but without a significant circulating volume, you're not going to be perfusing your your key organs. Um, hyperkalemia and other metabolic disturbances can send the heart into arrhythmias, which can lead to your cardiac arrest. And then hypothermia slows the the body's metabolic rate down to sort of un, unsustainable levels. And then in terms of the T's, thrombosis is, is the clot in your heart, brain, lungs, which can prevent function of, of these organs. Tension pneumothorax can compress the heart, prevent it from beating properly. Um, same can be said for, for cardiac tamponade, um, where fluid gets into the pericardial space, prevents the heart from pumping effectively. Uh, and then lastly, toxins, uh, a lot of substances can cause poisoning um, and, have, and most have good antidotes. So there are a lot of resources available to help with that. Uh, things like tox base. Um, yeah, so it's a lot of information here, but just, just good to think about a few of these things. Um, and then what I'd like to try and do now is, is go through some kind of case-based scenarios to try and get you to practice or, or think about how you might handle these situations if they were to come up as a when you're doctors in real life or if they were to come up in, in an OSCE station. Um, and I'll throw in a few SBAs as well to, to keep you interested. Um, so in terms of this first case, so transporting you two years in time, you're now the, the new F1s on the general surgical team um, and your bleep goes off and it's the nurse. And they're calling you because one of your patients seems a bit off. Um, and uh, so this patient is a 78 year old man. Uh, he's complaining of feeling hot, confused, uh, and lightheaded. So what are you going to do? Does this seem like an emergency? Uh, and so yeah, a sensible question at this point might be to, to ask some observations and maybe a bit more of a history to help you assess the severity. So in terms of that, our patient had some kind of abdominal surgery recently and up until today was progressing well uh, and then deteriorated today. So then looking at his, his observations, a rest rate 26, quite high, so, so we're already a bit concerned. O2 sats, potentially okay. Um, heart rate, 
a bit high and the, the blood pressure again is, is quite concerningly low and then finally the the temperature is is up as well so this is quite a concerning picture and uh, it's important i think that we go and see the patient straight away um again what are your differentials here have a have a think to yourself what what might be going on putting that all together but we'll go and see the patient um and we're going to start off our a to e assessment um so because you're a, you're a diligent F1, you quickly check there's no danger uh, and then you look for a response. Um, and yeah, he responds, says hello back quite quite feebly. Um, also, given the observations, it'd probably be fair to ask some, some help at this point. Um, so you might want the nurse to contact your registrar to come and help you. Um, so onto onto uh onto his airway so quick quick look feel listen of the airway shows that the airway is clear um and in addition he's talking to you which is good then assessing his breathing you notice that he appears breathless but otherwise has equal chest expansion is clear to percussion and auscultation you remeasure and his respiratory rate is still 26 sats are still uh 95 percent what are you going to do um so this is this is quite worrying. Uh, a high rest rate is often one of the key indicators of pathology. Um, so giving him some oxygen here will, will hopefully help him to breathe a bit more easily. Um, despite his SATs being OK in someone acutely unwell such as this, oxygen is often a, a good a good initial treatment. Um, then moving on to circulation, um, you know, he, he looks a bit flushed, feels hot to touch. Pulse is fast at sort of 96. Um, heart size normal, repeat temperature and blood pressure measurements um, are still a bit high. So are we worried? I think it'd be fair to say yes, we are concerned. So how are we going to investigate this guy further? So an SBA, what are we going to do at this point? OK, cool. So um, so what's hopefully going through your mind so far is that this guy sounds like he's got an infection um, and even more so we should be concerned about sepsis. Um, so now this question is, is effectively about your knowledge of the sepsis 6. Which two of these investigations contain elements of sepsis 6? Um, so getting cultures and, and lactate levels uh, are two elements. Um, so how do we know this guy has sepsis? Well, we can use this Q SOFA score. Um, so this stands for, for Quick Sequential Organ Failure Assessment and is a criteria you can use to assess whether you might be concerned about sepsis. Um, it encompasses these three areas. If a patient has any of these two, um, then you should be concerned that they might be septic. Um, and so these three areas are an altered mental state, um, which essentially means a GCS of anything less than 50, um, a fast respiratory rate, so above 22, and a, a low systolic. Um, so under 100. And in our patient, the, the nurse told us he was confused. Um, ref rate was 26, which is fast, and systolic was 86, which is quite low. Um, so with those observations in mind, you should be concerned about, about sepsis. And then a, a nice boring slide on the, the pathophysiology of sepsis, um, but it's essentially due to, do, uh, due to this cytokine response, which uh, allows fluid to, to leak out of the intravascular um, compartment and then in terms of your management it's it's the sepsis 6 so it's important to remember as this will be tested at, at all stages of your career um, so keep this simple 
you take three, you give three. Three things you take are your lactate level, your blood cultures, uh, and you assess your, your patient's fluid input output. Um, so for this, you might insert a catheter. Um, and then the three things you give are, are oxygen, antibiotics, and a fluid challenge. Um, nice way to remember it is that they kind of match up. So measuring their fluid level and giving fluids and taking blood cultures for infection and giving antibiotics, taking a lactate level uh, and giving oxygen. So to return to our patient, what are we missing? What else needs to be done? Um, so we've given high flow oxygen, which is the first element of the sepsis six. And then we just need to finish off our circulatory section so let's do an ABG to get the lactate level, send off our blood tests, including blood cultures, um, get the IV cannulas in and start fluid bolus, um, and then as well as some broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, and in, in sort of situations like this, um, if you're wondering what antibiotics to give, all hospitals um, and trusts provide local guidance for what they'd like to be prescribed. So the best thing to do uh, in an OSCE, I'd say, is so, uh, give broad spectrum antibiotics according to the local guidelines. Uh, and then in real life, look them up on Microguide or whatever the trust website is that, that you use. Um, cool. And then just uh, just to finish, um, reassessing, going through disability. And then when you expose the patient, uh, you can notice the, the surgical wound, which looks to be the source of the infection. Um, so that's your diagnosis confirmed and treatment initiated. Um, and then when your reg arrives, you hand over what you've done, they're going to be very pleased with what you've done. So, so that's sepsis covered. Um, try, a, try another case now. So you're a foundation year doctor working in, in A&E um, and you've got a 28 year old man who comes in with a painful red area on his leg after getting an insect bite. He's been prescribed and treated with antibiotics with cellulitis. And moments later, the, the nurse calls you back because they're worried about this guy. He's, uh, he's become quite distressed as his face is swollen and he's now struggling to breathe. Um, what are you thinking and what are you going to do now? So same again, you start your ABCD assessment, you check your prey danger response, shouting for some help. So check for any danger. There's, there's none to yourself, but is there any to the patient? It's possible that this has been caused by the antibiotics as that's the only thing that's really changed. Uh, so you stop them. Then check for a response um, and he's responsive, but he's talking in short sentences um, and this is a worrying situation. So escalating and getting help is very appropriate as potentially there's an airway issue here. So it might be worth calling a, a senior anaesthetist as you like to need the expertise. Uh, and then you get some observations there. So you start your assessment on his airway. His face looks swollen, as do his lips and his tongue, uh, and you can feel air on your cheek. You can hear this noisy breathing, this, this stridor breathing. Um, is this airway patent? Um, the presence of stridor suggests that it, it isn't a clear airway. So, so no, we're going to need to treat this in, in some capacity. Um, so here's a question on this. If we can get the SBA pull up. I've just seen the, the messages about trying to speed up a bit, so I'll, I'll try and try and get through it a bit quicker. Excellent. So this is uh, it's quite a standard question, but it's good to know the, the dosing of, of adrenaline needed. Um, and as most of you have said it correctly, that this is the dose um, and this is the route of adrenaline um, given in anaphylaxis. So one in 100 um, intramuscular adrenaline. Um, yeah, so uh, this is anaphylaxis and uh, this is a, a true 
medical uh, emergencies, it threatens the airway, so you need to act quickly. Um, and there are lots of different medications, but the, the big one to be aware of is adrenaline. Um, it's uh, to set, uh, anaphylaxis can affect the, the whole body. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, so anaphylaxis can affect the whole body. Uh, it causes this angioedema, um, edema in the, in the larynx that's life threatening. Uh, so it's important to be aware of and know how to manage. Um, so this is, is kind of just a slide um, to run through the signs that you might find in each component of your assessment. Um, so when you're assessing the airway, looking for strider, dysphagia, they might have a hoarse voice. Um, in terms of breathing, there might be signs of respiratory distress, uh, cyanosis, circulation, it could be pale, clammy, uh, hypertension, so it might be in shock. Disability, they might be confused, quite agitated, and then when you're exposed to the patient, they might have this kind of classic rash you get in, in, in anaphylaxis. Um, so going back to the case, we're just finishing off the assessment. Um, so we've given the adrenaline and the anaesthetist is now managing the airway, so we're happy to move on to breathing. Um, when you assess the patient, like we were saying, they, they might look flushed. Um, they might have a, well, they've got a wheeze throughout their, throughout their lungs. So we'll give them some high flow oxygen. Um, it's the, the O2 sats are low. Um, and then also if the patient's wheezing, you can give some salbutamol to help open up the, the small airways. Um, moving on to, to circulation, um, assessing our patient with, with anaphylaxis. Um, they're looking flushed, they're warm to touch, but the heart sounds are normal. Um, and then the observations, the blood pressure is the key one there that's really quite low. Uh, so we're going to need to get our IV access um, and then, then start a, a fluid challenge for the low blood pressure. Um, and then two other treatments to be aware of in, in anaphylaxis management uh, are the, the antihistamine chlorphenamine uh, and the steroid hydrocortisone, uh, which can be used to, to help dampen down the, the immune response, and help the patient recover. Uh, and then just to complete our assessment, checking the neurology and the glucose, um, exposing the patient, which might reveal this, this rash, um, the flushing. Uh, and then this is uh, just a little summary of the key treatments in anaphylaxis. Again, the most important being uh, adrenaline. So on to, uh, on to the third case. So we've got a 65 year old female here who has got some chest pain and dizziness that uh, occurred earlier when walking up a hill. Um, she's feeling a pain that's radiating to the, the left shoulder and jaw, uh, and she's got some past medical history of, of hypertension. Um, she's been brought in by the ambulance because she's been complaining of, of severe chest pain. Uh, when you go to see her, assessing for danger, checking response, call for help, assessing the airway, and the airway is clear. So moving on to breathing, which... Uh, which is all pretty normal. Um, looks a bit distressed, but has got normal expansion, symmetrical chest movements, the trachea is central, nothing on percussion. Um, the rest rates up a bit, so uh, but the sats are okay. So here, might consider is is ordering a blood gas um, and maybe a chest X-ray, given that there's some chest pain. So um, might be useful. But all in all, it's okay. So there's nothing really to treat here. Then moving on to circulation. Um, and here, that she's looking, she's grey, she's looking clammy, um, she's in obvious pain. Uh, she's got the classic cool, clammy peripheries. Um, and then looking at the observations, um, the heart rate's quite high. Blood pressure's a bit up, might fit with our hypertension. Um, urine output's okay, and then temperature's all right there. So we order an ECG. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, so the things we're considering here are the ECG, so the, the cardiac monitoring, um, and that's pretty essential in, in, in chest pain. And then blood tests are also vital, so um, a troponin level could be could be useful here to, to help indicate if this is a, a cardiac pathology. Um, so on to an SBA for this case.
Okay, so so a bit of a split picture here, um, and uh, so a few aspects I kind of wanted to bring up, and the point I wanted to highlight here is is to know is is knowing the the immediate treatment for your acute coronary syndrome, um, and in this case it's an end stemi, um, indicated by the the ST depression in the anterior leads, and then the raised troponin, and then also talking about her gray score, um, always kind of leading you towards an end stemi, which Again, we'll be covered a bit more in a cardio lecture, but this would be just a brief summary of your acute coronary syndrome management. Um, and so the things we need to consider giving here are, are morphine for pain relief, um, metoclopramide to counteract the nausea that the, the morphine might cause. Um, there's a debate about oxygen um, and the current guidance is that you only give oxygen um, in acute coronary syndrome if the SATs are below 94%. Uh, in this case, they're at 96, so oxygen is not needed. Um, and uh, also kind of on that point, uh, if oxygen was necessary, it'd probably be a better answer to go for high flow oxygen over low flow. Um, and then other medications used in nitrates, which uh, have already been given um, in the vignette. Uh, and then aspirin therapy. So the other the other answer that was quite popular was B, and it isn't the worst answer, um, but it's incorrect because we've arranged for the patient to go for PCI already. So the fond and the, the anticoagulation isn't isn't necessary. Um, and then E is, is your secondary prevention of, of, of ACS. Um, so to go through, um, we've so this is just finishing off the, the assessment for circulation, um, including our, our treatments here at the bottom. Um, we put our two cannula in, give the morphine, the GTN sprayer, and then some aspirin and then assessing the suitability for, for PCI. Um, and then, again, yeah, just finishing off, the, checking the disability and exposure, and then important here to, to get a cardiology review um, when she goes off to, to get the PCI. Um, and then I've included these two flow charts in here for, from NICE. So this is the, um, this is the, uh, this is the, the flow chart for, for a STEMI. Um, and they're kind of more just for reference afterwards because they're quite heavy, um, but they've got all the guidance you need there um, just to look through afterwards. If you find these two, so here's the, the end STEMI one, they're a bit complicated, then um, PASMED's got two similar ones. Um, but they're, they're much more simplified, so I'd recommend looking those ones up and, and, and learning them. Um, but again, the, the treatment of that will be, we've gone into a bit more detail in the cardio lecture. Um, so on to to the fourth case and this is the last case we'll do like this um, and then I've got a few more SBAs at the end just to highlight a few different a few more points. Um, so the situation here is we've got a, a 37 year old um, who's been brought in by ambulance after her colleague found found her slumped at, at her desk. Um, so this colleague's not accompanied the patient and there's no other real available history at this time. Um, and then yeah we, we start the assessment so there's, there's no danger the patient's responsive, but a bit drowsy. Um, but her airway is clear and she can talk. Um, then in terms of uh, assessing her, her breathing, note that she's struggling and she's very short of breath. Um, her rest rate's up, as are her SATs. Um, and then you get an ABG uh, at this point, which shows a, a low pH, so indicating an acidosis. Um, so at this point, given a high rest rate, it might be a good idea to put some oxygen on. Again, up for a bit of debate, but quite good in the in the acute setting. And then circulation wise, again, there isn't too much to find. Um, our observations are showing a bit of a tachycardia, but the blood pressure is OK. Um, cat refill is a, is a bit low, is a bit slow, so possibly indicating a bit of dehydration. Um, and it would be it would be sensible to to get an ECG given the tachycardia. Um, but she seems quite dehydrated, so therefore getting getting your cannula in will, will help to get a fluid regime going. Um, and then whilst you're waiting for the fluids to finish off your assessment, um, you can uh, measure the uh, the glucose um, and dipping the urine. So we've got the full ABG here, which is showing a, a metabolic acidosis. Um, with high glucose levels and then raised ketones in the urine. Um, so what's your, what are your key differentials here? What are you thinking? Um, 
so I've got an SBA on this, and uh, just to, just to hint with this SBA, read through the observations carefully. I've changed a few of them. Um, Okay, nice. Um, yeah, so uh, so I hope you all worked out that this is diabetic ketoacidosis, and then this is good. So the point I just wanted to make with with this SBA is not to try and catch you out, but this patient's seriously unwell um, with a systolic below ninety. Um, so this patient's unstable, and we need to use resuscitation fluids rather than your standard DKA fluid. Uh, regime and then once the blood pressure is stable we can commence uh, our fluid regime for DK. Um, so again if the, if the blood pressure had been a bit higher then the correct answer would have been starting at one litre of saline. Um, so just a bit of background on, on DK uh, and what happens when you don't produce any insulin so type 1 diabetes you can't get glucose into your cells. Cells then have to find an alternative source of energy so they switch to fat metabol metabolism which uh, produces ketones as a byproduct. Um, the glucose levels in the blood then get too high for the kidneys to cope and the excessive glucose draws the water out of your cells and into the blood. Uh, and then this is lost via the kidneys in the urine. So then this is your uh, osmotic diuresis. And the overall effect is that the patient slowly becomes more and more dehydrated. And then they present in this drowsy or unconscious state due to the profound dehydration. Um, and then in terms of management, the key focus is, is rehydration. Uh, so this is the, the typical regime used, starting with one litre over one hour, one litre over two hours, then another two, and then four, four, and then six. Um, and you'll also need to start them on an insulin infusion to help bring her to br help bring down the, the glucose levels. Uh, and this is a weight-based calculation, so it's 0.1 units per kilogram per hour. So in our 70 kilo patient, this would be 70 units an hour of, of fast-acting insulin. Um, and then the way you prescribe this or, or work this out is that you would do you would take 50 units of, of your act rapid of your insulin and you put this into 50 millilitres of your saline. So that would mean that there was then one unit per one mil um, of fluid. And then you can prescribe that at a rate of seven mils per hour if you're treating your seven, 70 kg person, eight, eight mils per hour if it's if it's for an 80 kilo person, um, etc. And then the final things to be aware of with DKA is, is the potassium levels. Um, so as insulin uh, drives potassium intracellularly, so if your potassium level is normal or, or low, then you'll need to add some potassium to your fluid regime. Uh, and then finally, you don't want your glucose level to go too low, push them into hypoglycemia. Um, so once the levels reach less than 14, um, you might want to consider giving some, some glucose too, but that's quite an advanced uh, level down the down the treatment ladder. Um, right on to sort of just a few more SBAs uh, towards the end of the, the lecture now. So um, have a go at this one. Excellent. So the correct answer here is A. So so this is, I'm, I'm sure most of you have guessed, is, is pulmonary embolism. Um, she has risk factors. She's had a recent operation. 
um, and she's symptomatic in that she's breathless and she's got positive signs of a DVT. Uh, this is all enough to suggest that she's got a PE uh, and should be treated immediately. Um, so just a little bit of background been covered in the, in the ref's talk, but it occurs due to an obstruction or blockage of the pulmonary vessels, uh, which therefore prevent gas exchanges. There's a decreased amount of, of blood moving through the lungs, typically presents with your breathlessness and your peritic chest pain, this pain on taking a deep breath. Um, then this is a, it's a summary of the acute management um, in PE. So this is taken from the NICE guidelines again, but I think it just displays it well. Um, you, you don't need to learn the well score, but it's good just to read through to kind of have an appreciation of what people score the points for. Um, so uh, if you if you have a raised well score, then a PE is more likely. So if it's over four points um, and you should get a CTPA anticoagulate in the meantime, a lower well score indicates that a PE is unlikely uh, and a D-dimer test could be used to assess whether a, a clot is, is likely or not. Um, and then this is the, the treatment table, which may be useful to read through after the lecture in terms of the treatments to offer in, in certain or specific situations like renal impairment, for instance. Um, but I've summarised it, it here. Um, and basically, nice recommend that apixaban or rivaroxaban are your anticoagulants of choice. And then low molecular weight heparin could also be used. Um, other things to consider in your management of a PE are oxygen and pain relief to, to aid with the symptoms. Um, and then also it's useful to be aware that if the patient's really, really unstable, um, so if it's a systolic of under 90, um, then you might consider thrombolysis um, and then ITU involvement if necessary. Uh, and then here's just your example of a, a CTPA showing this this sort of saddle shaped embolus blocking the, the pulmonary arteries across here. Um, on to another question. Yeah, excellent. Um, so this is testing your management of, of status epilepticus. So the patient is, is now 30 minutes into a convulsive seizure, so they're in status. Um, in terms of your, your first stage, you, you give your benzodiazepine um, according to, to what's available and what the patient can take. Um, so either your, your buccal midazolam, um, this gel squirted between the gum and the cheek, or rectal diazepam, or your IV lorazepam. Uh, stage two, again, if there's no response to the first dose, you give a second dose of, of a benzodiazepine. Then the third dose, if the second benz doesn't work, then you use one of your anti-epileptics. So it used to be phenytoin, um, but also valparate, levetiracetat can also be can also be used. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then you're stepping up further to, to arranging intubation and ITU, um, ITU care. So just a uh, just a short management summary um, of uh, of status. Um, you give you you two benzodiazepines, uh, then your phenytoin or anti-epileptics, um, and then if this still doesn't work, you move on to rapid sequence induction and transfer to ITU. Um, so then I've nicked this flowchart off Google Images, but I think this is quite nice uh, if you're a bit more of a visual person that helps to kind of break it down. Um, in this chart, they've put midazolam uh, instead of lorazepam, but then also they've they've gone for the levetiracetam instead of phenytoin here. Um, but it's just a, a, a nice a nice uh, step through. Um, cool. On to uh, another question.
cool. Yeah, very nice. So this is just following on from Shreds Respiratory Talk. Um, and again, don't be phased by the fact that the patient's young. This is just testing your knowledge of uh, acute mass, acute asthma management. Um, so for all the attacks, you'll, you'll give nebulized salbutamol. Um, if the patient can swallow, then give them oral prednisolone. Uh, if they can't, then you can use IV hydrocortisone. Um, and then this is severe asthma shown by the inability to complete sentences and, and the low SATs. Um, so the addition of ipratropium would be advised. Um, and then it, it can also that can be added to the to the nebulized salbutamol as well and given both together. Um, so then this is just a sort of a brief summary of how an ABCD assessment of asthma might look. Um, so can the patient talk, sitting them upright, um, doing your basic maneuvers, any secretions, then giving them some oxygen, um, so assessing their breathing, then giving them some oxygen, some salbutamol, a nebulizer driven by the oxygen can help. And you can give five of these back to back. So roughly take six minutes for one nebulizer. So that's about 30 minutes of treatment. Um, and then also you can add in the ipratropium bromide, um, but you can only give it ipratropium four times. So QDS max um, and then QDS maximum. Um, and then in terms of C, getting your IV access, doing ABG, um, possibly an ECG, a chest X-ray. And this is where you can give you steroids. Um, and so these are the medications commonly used in acute asthma um, with the NICE acronym, but go through it. You've got your oxygen, your salbutamol, um, your steroid there, hypotropium, and then further down the list, you've got your um, am aminophylline and then magnesium. Um, and if this still doesn't work, then this is when you're escalating it and getting more people involved, getting ITU involved. Um, OK, this is the last question. Um, so we can get a poll on this one. Okay, so uh, a bit of a, a bit of a tough one to finish on. Um, so, so this is hypo, uh, hyperkalemia, um, as shown by the um, hyperkalemia, as shown by ECG changes. Um, so you've got the uh, the inverted uh, the, the T waves, the ST depression, QT elongation. Um, so you talk tented T waves, um, and then the problem with with hyperkalemia, high potassium, is that you're at risk of developing arrhythmias. Um, such as VT or torsade. Um, how might this have happened? So the hyperkalemia here is likely to have been caused by an AKI. Um, so this is kind of indicated in, in the fact that he's not passed any urine in, in the last 12 hours. So that's one of your criteria for AKI. Um, and then just going through a few of the answers. So calcium gluconate um, is a, it's a useful drug because it stabilizes the myocardium. So that will help you prevent an arrhythmia. Um, then salbutamol and insulin, uh, they don't actually get rid of the potassium, they just move it in, in intracellularly. Um, and PCI, so this isn't a STEMI. So then that leaves you with dialysis, and that's actually the, the only option that will definitively remove the potassium from the blood, is the, the hemodialysis. Um, so just briefly, we'll go through the, the management of hyperkalemia. Um, so so it's defined as, as a potassium level above 5.5. So that's your, your upper limit of normal. 5.5 um, to 5.9 would be your mild hyperkalemia. Uh, 6 to 6.4 is moderate. And then above 6.5 is severe hyperkalemia. Uh, and like we said, the, the key risk is, is this propensity to cause arrhythmias. Um, and then there are different elements to your treatment. So if ECG changes are shown, then protecting the myocardium is going to be your first port call. And this is going to be your calcium chloride or calcium gluconate um, are the useful treatments. Then you need to lower the blood potassium level to buy you a bit of time. So this is where your insulin and salbutamol can be 
come in handy and they both drive the potassium into cells. Uh, and then finally, you need to get rid of all that excess potassium. Um, and so that's where treatments like renal replacement therapy, so hemodialysis, um, peritoneal dialysis and calcium rhizonium can also be used. Um, and then also it, it's good to, to investigate further and try and find out what has happened, why this has happened um, and why this person has gone into to hyperkalemia. Um, so just to just to summarise, um, we've gone through uh, today. Um, I've kind of gone through that key structure and tried to apply it to some cases just to give you a bit of an idea of what you might do and how you might act in, in an in OSCE station or in real life. Uh, and then been through the management of a few other emergencies. So we've done BLS and advanced life support, sepsis, anaphylaxis, ACS, diabetic ketoacidosis, pulmonary embolism, status, asthma and hyperkalemia. Then some things that I didn't cover, but you perhaps might want to consider um, at this list on the right. Um, and yeah, just, just so you can, when you when it comes to kind of doing your OSCE practice or something and, and trying out your, your ABCD structure. Um, but yeah, so uh, so thank you for, for watching. I hope this was useful. Um, really appreciate uh, if you could take the time to fill in the feedback form. Um, it's really useful, is it? Um, it's useful to hear what your thoughts are and, and how we can change and adapt these to, to make them as useful as possible. Um, and yeah, basically, thank you for watching. Um, if you've got any uh, questions, feel free to, to message myself um, or any of the team. Uh, I've included the emails there and then also got another slide that um, that has a few useful resources, um, including um, uh, Dr. Piper's YouTube channel, of the UCL Acute Medicine. Um, but cool, Isaac, are there any questions in the chat that we could run by? Um, run by Dr. Piper. Um, I think we've covered them all. <clears throat> um, but if you guys have got any more burning questions, um, send them in now and we can ask Dr. Piper. I think I saw one that was to do with um, to do with COVID and, and how that might interact with your BLS and your Dr. ABCDE. I don't know if you've got any, any points or thoughts on that. <clears throat> yeah, so, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. So I think I'd probably just first of all um, say at the outset that in terms from an examination point of view, COVID is very unlikely to fit into it, maybe in future years, but certainly not for this current year four. So, but from a practical point of view, in terms of COVID resuscitation, um, there is um, a guideline, a short guideline, which I'll, I'll post on uh, the Splice channel a little bit later, but basically in a nutshell, most important thing is obviously if you're not in full PPE then you must bear in mind that potentially if the patient's COVID positive then there's a risk of transmission um, and again this is this this guidance was redone prior to vaccination um, and although obviously vaccination in the hospital isn't complete just bear in mind that basically usually when you remember that when you do a head touch and lift to confirm cardiac arrest then you should avoid doing that in COVID and just look for signs of life and feel for femoral or carotid pulses. But obviously, for obvious reasons, you don't get too close to the patient unless you're in full PPE. Um, and the other thing from a team personnel point of view is obviously minimising the number of patients in the room, number of sorry, people in the room at the time. Freudian slip and uh, also um, just making sure that if for example a patient gets intubated that everyone's in full PPE because obviously that can uh, aerosolize the um, aerosolize the procedure that's probably all I'd say um, as I say it's, it's not an exam issue it's more one of day-to-day -day workplace but again I will stick the advice up on the UCL Acute Medicine and the Splice channels when I finish this evening. Uh, Another question here. In terms of an AT station, is there any scope for a scenario where a patient deteriorated rapidly and were required to do BLS? In this situation, do we stop the assessment where we were? Yeah, good question. So I think the answer would be no, because these are two skill sets that we're trying to assess you on. And first thing as well to say is that the, um, so I was a, a Mosque examiner um, and probably examined one or two of you in the Mosque. Um, I think just to re really emphasize what Chris has said, and again, great job, guys, Chris and Isaac, just to say that it's really important about how I cannot emphasize enough from an examiner's point of view, how being systematic is important, and that you have practice as well. I think 
my view is that a number of you, I think, underestimated how much there is to do in five minutes, but that you can do it in five minutes with practice. That's the critical uh, thing. So, for example, a lot of you, when you came in, for example, spent about a minute and a half um, trying to get your gloves on and all that sort of stuff now bearing in mind in your exam there will be ppe time but it's just really getting in as chris is saying getting there being systematic starting off straight away with your initial approach um and getting high flow oxygen on, calling for help getting monitoring on and working systematically through that so again i can't emphasize chris's point enough but but no so the bls is it's its own skill and if we were to do if we were to examine basic life support it would be a station of its own Accords because the two processes are different. It may well be that in your year six exam, we may put in more of an ALS type station, excuse me, which could be a double station in its own right. But again, not, that doesn't happen very often. Um, but certainly at this stage of year four, no, it's not likely. Uh, and I think last question is, is when is the best place in your doctor OBCD to administer specific treatment, e.g. hydrocortisone in adrenal crisis? Well, so, I mean, it's important to remember that so you, the whole premise of ABCDE is that you are identifying life-threatening problems as you find them. Obviously, airway being the most pressing and working your way down from there. Um, and so ultimately, so I mean, adrenal crisis is one of those slightly odd ones that probably fits into um, a mix of sort of C and E. Um, and I would probably just in that case, so yeah, if, I mean, if, if it's obvious that the patient has 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 a history of Addison's disease and has been unwell, then obviously once you realise that the patient's hypotensive, for example, then that should be your cue to give steroids as well as volume um, repletion. Certainly what is critical, though, however, is once you recognise that you have the problem and you must ad identify your treatment strategy early on. So, for example, in the Mosky where I'm hoping you guys have all done it, otherwise I've just shot myself in the foot. But in the so, for example, in the in the Mosky, for example, the patient who had circulatory collapse, I'll put it this way. And what we didn't want to see is, is not, for example, administering fluids at the very end. So in your management plan, oh, I'd give IV fluids. What you're showing us is that you haven't understood or appreciated the information that you're being given. And that's why it does have to be quite slick and quick, because actually what you want to be doing is getting through. You want to be thinking about your assessment, what you're measuring and your intervention at each step. So, for example, if you have uh, assessed the patient, so for example, in circulation, that's probably quite an easy one. You assess their spirit, their blood pressure, pulse, capillary for time. Uh, and their sort of overall appearance, colour, mottling, etc. You um, take you in you interventionists to insert a cannula and probably give some IV fluids. Again, it's very unlikely that you would have a, an ABCD station that will not require fluids and oxygen. I think you can probably take those as a given as the, as not giving fluids. Example, such as in pulmonary edema, it, again, is probably on the scope of, of, of what we want you to be at the end of year four. Thirdly, then you want to then think about, OK, so when you put your cannula into then given intervention, such as um, putting, you know, taking blood tests and things like that. So it's your assessment, it's your intervention and your management plan. And that's you have to sort of think about those three bits at each step of um, each step of the way. So yes, once you have identified something that needs treating, that is important that you do that at that time when you've identified it and not delay too long. Thank you. Uh, so someone's just put in, uh, just asking a bit of clarification on when you would use a normal face mask for oxygen. Never. It's a short answer. So um, the so the the normal face masks that you see around, otherwise AKA a Hudson's mask, are, are basically they are simply pieces of thick plastic that sit over a patient with air piped into it and the reason that, that, that I, i'm sort of a bit churlish about it is because what's really critical especially is that you can actually work identify how much oxygen or what percentage of oxygen or otherwise known as their fiot the fraction of inspired oxygen how much they're on and the problem with face masks is that you they should only they should usually have a flow between five and ten liters 
But five litres via a Hudson mask, let's say, is not the same as, say, 35 percent via a Venturi system. So when you're trying to work out the oxygen gradient, if you like, or how much is my oxygen debt is another way of putting it, or how much oxygen am I needing to put in to make give my patient normal oxygen values? If you have a Hudson mask or a plain face mask, you can't actually make that determination. Very similar to nasal specs. That's why two litres of nasal specs is not the same as 24% oxygen um, because they're not designed for that. And they're obviously patients will, how patients breathe is significant in terms of nasal specs. Anyway, I mean, I digress, but the, the most important thing really is to, you want to use as much as possible, um, be clear about what concentration of oxygen you're on. So when you're interpreting the blood gas, you can do it more scientifically. With nasal cannula and plain mask, you're making an educated guess. And for patients who are critic, potentially critically unwell, that's quite a tricky thing to do. So face masks, have no role in acute medicine. The only time in which practically you'll actually really only see them is on a theatre corridor when patients are going from uh, the operating theatre into recovery. It's probably the only time I actually ever see them in clinical practice. But remember, even with that, that's because they have an ODP and an anaesthetist watching over the patient on that journey. And so they you have the and they'll have their their airway with them. So that's the only time which you can ever probably justify in acute medicine. You never should be seeing plain face masks at all. Cool. Uh, well, I think that's I think that's all. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, no worries. I would if I could helpful. just be very quickly cheekily add just um, just to. Um, there is has been a, some new literature. I've been emailed about them today. So a new evidence base for um, anaphylaxis. I've already posted it in the UCL Acute Medicine channel. I'll again post it in Splice this evening. There is an important change in emphasis. Just sorry, just to really reiterate the point that Chris was making earlier about how important the use of adrenaline is. And actually, there's reduced evidence now for the use of pyroton and hydrocortisone routinely in everyone. So that's just a bit of an FYI, but I will post that again later. And very final thing, just with the renal, with the hyperkalemia, my advice in terms of guidance to read is the British Renal Association have a very new but quite easy read hyperkalemia guidance, which is what the new ALS guidance has been um, designed on. So again, I'll post that for you on UCL Acute Med and the uh, Splice channel this evening, just because there are newer, the, the, the hyperkalemia guidance has changed a little bit. For example, calcium rhizonium is rarely used now because it's poorly tolerated. And unless any of you like eating clay, which basically is what calcium rhizonium is, and most patients don't like that, um, then we use um, a newer uh, sodium cicrosylate or something like that. So again, I'll post that this evening. So there are minor changes, but um, again, the important thing to remember is if there is if there's controversy about guidance um, or there is a lack of consensus opinion, then we would not put that in an exam for you. So there are always important to bear in mind that in terms of your SBA and OSCEs, there will always be certainty because otherwise your OSCE and the SBA becomes neither fair nor objective or accurate. So always try and remember as well that when you're thinking about exam questions and what, what we're interested in, try and also think about what is it that the university is asking us and what is it we want to detect of you. And that sometimes I think can be easier and, and bear in mind that assessments generally are written and staged so that 80% of you will pass, which for a degree subject is not bad. Uh, so I'll just try and reassure you a little bit. But again, um, I won't interrupt Chris anymore, but I'm very happy to take questions. Or again, as always, you can post on the UCL Acute Med um, teams or drop me an email. Thanks very much, Chris and uh, Isaac. Good job, as always. Brilliant. Thanks to, thanks to yourself. Thank you for joining. Hello, for coming. Right, Chris, I'll stop the recording now. Thank you. Right, Tara. Cheers, you cheers no problem, no problem. Right, I'll catch you later. Yeah. Mm -hmm.